Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the evening news bulletin on ITV. I'm Nuhar Azak. In the headlines at this hour. New 72-hour Gaza ceasefire implemented. Nigeria confirmed new Ebola cases. And South Africa's deputy president testifies at the Marikana Commission. The case against five pro-Palestinian supporters who were arrested yesterday following a demonstration in Cape Town has been dropped. The group's lawyer, Abdurrahman Khan, told ITV News that the senior prosecutor at the Cape Town Magistrates Court decided that there was insufficient evidence against the accused. The group, which included a mother of four, was held overnight on charges under the Illegal Gatherings Act. And this morning, the accused were taken from Cape Town Police Station to Bauer Police Station, or sorry, not Bauer Police Station, but the headquarters of the special unit uh, crimes against the state, um, uh, also previously known as the walks, where they were profiled, fingerprints taken, uh, checked for previous records, pending cases, and, and, and these kind of things. Uh, this took about, about two hours. Um, the accused, and whilst we were there, the matter was discussed with the senior public prosecutor who had insight in the docket content, looked at all the statements, and after due consideration, uh, the senior public prosecutor decided not to proceed or, or charge the accused as there were insufficient evidence uh, in the docket as of that point in time. Uh, the docket was in knowledge prosecute and <coughs> Um, the accused will be set uh, free to let go. South Africa showed its support for Palestine on Saturday as more than 150,000 people marched through the streets of Cape Town. The mass march was organized by the National Coalition for Palestine, a newly formed entity comprising of faith-based and civil organizations who are calling on the South African government to take a more proactive stance against the Israeli government and the Zionist lobby. The march attracted a number of struggle heroes and political stalwarts, such as Ahmed Katrada and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who addressed the crowd calling for an immediate end to the occupation of the Palestinian territories. The pursuit of the people of Palestine for freedom, for freedom from humiliation, from persecution, from the unjust policies of Israel. That is something that is unstoppable because it is a righteous cause. It is a righteous cause. It is God's own cause. For God created us for freedom. God created all of us for freedom. God has no stepchildren. All of us are God's children. All of us have been given the gift of freedom. Staying on the Middle East conflict, Israel and Palestine yesterday agreed to a new 72-hour ceasefire. Hamas has demanded an end to is the Israeli and Egyptian blockades of the coastal territory. Israeli airstrikes and shelling killed nine Palestinians in Gaza yesterday, which included a 14-year-old boy and a woman on the third day of renewed fighting. Hamas spokesman Sami Abu Zuhri said negotiations during the new truce would be a final attempt for a deal. Meanwhile, Turkey has begun transferring wounded Palestinians from the Gaza Strip for medical treatment. 
The move comes as Turkish government supported an Egyptian call for a truce to provide a humanitarian air corridor to Gaza. After a month of bloodshed, more than 1,917 Palestinians have been killed and more than 9,000 wounded. Turkish Foreign Minister Ahmed Davutoglu said Turkey planned to bring in around 200 wounded in the first stage of the plan and would hold further talks with Israel and Egypt to agree to more flights. Nigeria's capital Lagos has confirmed 10 cases of Ebola today, an increase from the seven cases at last count. All cases of the virus were from people who had had primary contact with American Liberian national Patrick Sawyer, who collapsed on arrival at Lagos Airport on July 25th and later died. To date, only two people have died from the virus. The West African Ebola outbreak is the worst in history, and the World Health Organization said it represents an international health emergency that will likely continue spreading for months. As of today, 177 primary and secondary contacts of the index case have been placed under surveillance or isolation. Nine developed Ebola virus disease, bringing the total number of cases in Nigeria to 10. Of these 10, two have died, that is, the Liberian American and the Nigerian nurse, while eight are alive and currently on treatment. Nigeria is actually, uh, as of now, uh, reaching out to various uh, laboratories, various governments, including the U.S. state governments, uh, to see how some of these uh, untried but uh, drugs and vaccines that seem to hold out some hope uh, could also be deployed in Nigeria. We are, we are in touch and uh, it's possible uh, that very soon uh, we have to we'll probably go the same way. The World Health Organization Medical Ethics Committee met in Geneva today to discuss the use of experimental drugs to tackle the Ebola virus outbreak after two U.S. aid workers showed improvement after being treated with the ZMAP, a drug developed by California-based MAP Biopharmaceutical. With the disease now in four African countries, the World Health Organization has said that this is the world's worst outbreak of Ebola, with 1,779 cases and 962 deaths. The outbreak has been classified as an international health emergency. A passenger plane crashed on the outskirts of Iran's capital Tehran on Sunday morning, killing 39 people and injuring nine others. The Antonov 140 plane bound for Iran's eastern Tabas city crashed after taking off from Tehran's Mirabad airport. A total of 48 passengers and crew members were on board when the plane crashed in the residential area of the Azadi town. Failure in one of the plane's engines called the, caused the plane to crash on the northern side of Tehran's Karaj Highway. Residents of the eastern Ukrainian city of Donetsk on Monday woke to the sounds of shelling. Ukrainian government forces are preparing for the final stage of recapturing the city of Donetsk from pro-Russian separatist rebels after making significant gains that has divided rebel forces. An artillery shell fired in fighting between government forces and separatist rebels hit a high-security prison in the Ukrainian city of Donetsk on Sunday night killing one inmate, while 106 inmates escaped from the jail, a strict regime prison for dangerous criminals. Convicted British drug trafficker and fraudster Martin Evans will remain in a South African jail until his extradition to the UK. Evans, named by British police in 2012 as one of their most wanted fugitives, appeared in Randburg Magistrates Court in Johannesburg, where a judge granted an order for him to be extradited back to the UK, while awaiting the Justice Minister to sign off on his extradition. The 52-year-old was jailed in Britain for 21 years in 2006 for conspiracy to supply cocaine and fraudulent trading, but he escaped in 2011 when he failed to return to the prison after being released on a five-day license. 
Evans sw swindled more than 100 investors, many newly retired pensioners, out of around 1.5 million U.S. dollars by promising huge returns from a Spurs ostrich breeding business. We'll be back shortly after this break. Stay with us. South Africa's Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa told an inquiry today that he was trying to pre prevent further loss of life when he intervened in a wildcat strike that ended with police killing 34 minors. Ramaphosa has faced accusations of putting political pressure on the police to take action against striking Longman employees before the shooting at the Marakane mine on August 16, 2012. Ramaphosa was a lawnman director at the time of the incident. The issue of negotiations has to remain prominent in anybody's mind who is dealing in a situation where there are various parties trying to find a solution. And that is a clear option. But another option, which was considered, as I've said in this case, is to make sure that there is stability. In this case, it was very relevant that people, no further people should be killed. Yes. So, yes, it, it was an option. But the, the email, one of the concerns that you expressed in your email of the 11th is the wage gap yes. between what Implots was paying and what your company was paying. But we were dealing with a situation from a variety of angles. And we needed, in my view, what was prominent was to make sure that no further deaths should occur. As I got reports that more and more people were being killed, I got quite alarmed. Yes. On his hands. Yeah. Yes. Will you please leave the room? I, on his hands. Will you please Blood leave? Will you please Blood leave the room immediately? Blood on his hands. Blood on his hands. Blood on his hands. The commission Blood on his hands. The commission Blood will return. On his hands. Blood on his hands. Blood on Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan declared victory in Turkey's first direct presidential elections yesterday. However, this morning voters in Istanbul said they were not surprised by the result, though some were unhappy it did not go into a second round. Erdogan's victory in Sunday's vote takes him a step closer to the executive presidency he has long coveted for Turkey. But it is the outcome which his opponents fear will herald an increasingly authoritarian rule. The chairman of the High Election Board confirmed Erdogan had a majority with more than 99% of the votes counted and will be inaugurated on August 28th. Let's take a look at the day's financial indicators. Assalamu alaikum and good evening. This financial market update is brought to you by Oasis Crescent Capital, your Sharia compliant leader in Islamic wealth management. The Rand is firm against the major currencies, trading at 10 Rand 69 against the US dollar and 17 Rand 93 to the British pound. Against the broader currencies, the Rand is trading at 5 Rand 72 to the Indian rupee. Commodities had a slow start to the week with gold at $1,308.70 per ounce and Brent crude at $104.9 per barrel. On the Islamic indicators, the Nisab is at 4,591 and the Mer Fatimi at 11,478. Markets across South Africa showed solid numbers as the all share climbed to 51,391 in earlier trade today. Globally, markets reported strong demand. The Nikkei is up 2.4% at 15,131. Turning to the Middle East, we see mixed performance. The Abu Dhabi Dubai indices increased to 4,998 and 4,820 respectively. Looking at markets in the Far East, the Hang Seng reported a 1.3% increase to 24,646. 
In Eastern Europe, the Istanbul index posted a lower 78,358, while across the Asian subcontinent, the Bombay Sensex closed the day's trade on a positive 25,519. Today we focus on your changing investment needs relative to your living circumstances. Over the course of time, your ability to save will change and you need to ensure that you are prepared for the changes that the future brings. When you are younger, you will go through a stage where you will need to acquire an education, start your first job, purchase a vehicle, get married, perhaps buy a house and even start a family. At this stage of your life, your expense base will be high and your earnings will need to accommodate for these expenses. You will notice from this graph that when you are younger, you also have a higher appetite for risk. This means that your opportunity to take advantage of the greatest benefits derived from long-term investing is most prominent the younger you are. So saving, even if it is a monthly contribution, has to begin as early as possible. As you move through all your life stages, the level of risk you will be able to absorb decreases. At the same time, you will also need to adjust how you save and the products that are most appropriate for you. You may have a higher cash flow as your expenses decline. The Oasis product range has been carefully designed to cater for different risk and age profiles where the inflation protection of the underlying instruments are tailored to meet the evolving life staging spectrum of each of our clients. Speak to your Oasis advisor to find out how each product can be used to accommodate your needs and lifestyle over time. This market update was brought to you by Oasis Crescent Capital, your Sharia compliant leader in Islamic wealth management. Growing your wealth the Oasis way, the compliant way. We'll be back shortly after this with your community news updates. Stay with us. Welcome back. In your community news this evening, the University of Johannesburg's Department of Religious Studies and the Jesuit Institute of South Africa is hosting a talk on deconversion. Why do people walk away from their faith? This is hosted on the 13th of August at the Auckland Park campus in Johannesburg. This talk will be rendered by Professor Jay Hornbeck, the chair of the Department of Theology at the Fordham University in New York. For more information, email religiousstudiesuj at gmail.com. The Sakina Foundation is hosting a series of lectures on perfecting Salah from the 12th of August at the Taranga Road Masjid Hall in Rondebosch, Cape Town. The basics of Nafil Salah in general, its related laws, the essential of congregational Salah are some of the topics that will be discussed. For more information, call 21 Seven six two six seven four five, or email info at sakinafoundation.co.za. Mulana Mujahid White is hosting a talk on the Muslima modern fiqh and related matters, starting on the twelfth of August at the Taranga Road Masjid Hall in Rondebosch. Topics such as fiqh of women, how to be informed, empowered, and enlightened, iconic women, and their successes will be discussed. For more information, call 078-610-4700. Here is a recap of today's top stories. New 72-hour Gaza ceasefire implemented. Nigeria confirmed new Ebola cases. And South Africa's Deputy President testifies at the Marikana Commission. That brings us to the end of this news bulletin. For further news updates, do join us on Facebook and Twitter. From myself and the ITV crew in Cape Town, we wish you a pleasant evening further. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.